الله والسلام والسلام على رسول الله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم الهمنا مراشد امورنا واعذنا من شرور انفسنا the ruku that was recited is from the surah which is known as surah an-nisa the surah of women when a boy is not married and every time he has the word woman he wakes up and when a man is married and every time he has the word woman he also wakes up but the two of them for different reasons while you were having supper one uncle said a very nice thing because they were speaking of the mosquitoes that you see in Tongat then he said but you know that in the mosquito who is biting it's the female he said from that time they are biting us eating our blood so then i said to him nicely but you see that female it only starts looking for blood so it can feed its babies so where the babies came from came from the husbands for which reason we tell many boys when they get married that remember the day your wife starts going off it's because her hormonal system has changed what changed it it's after she came close to you a girl will say for 17 years i never had these sicknesses then she got married as soon as she touches her husband he makes a second hand after that day she has to become ready for pregnancy if you always angry that why you got fat the answer is you made a fat You made a fat. You supposed to feel more sorry for her. That once upon a time you were so unique. I touched you. If you see her getting moods, mood swings, pains, stomach pains, everything is because the man touched. So when that mosquito comes to take your blood next time, don't kill the female. Go look for the male also. That had it not been him, she wouldn't be looking for blood. The surah, surah and nisa, explains this very point. that the problem is not with the woman the problem is with the man it is a surah where allah tawarukullah speaks in a very harsh manner very harsh and it got to do with nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam on unique sentence he said he said la yusalu rajul fi ma daraba imra'a a man will never be questioned why did he hit his wife a man will never be questioned why did he hit his wife that's all he says And then that hadith they put it in the chapter of taqwa. That the fear of Allah, chapter of taqwa or muraqaba. That carry on thinking, thinking, thinking I'm being watched and they brought this narration. So they explain the narration that what does this narration got to do with this chapter muraqaba? A man won't be questioned why it is wife. They say after marriage takes place the girl even if she wants to complain to her father her mother she feels it very hard the man understands that even if she complains her father will tell her i can't help you so she just keeps quiet and after he notices she got no place to scream he gives her another shot so allah's nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it la yusalu rajul a man will never be questioned why did he hit his wife But it ended little bit after that so the man must understand that if no one questions him here someone's going to question him there the places of zulm is normally when the other party is weak i was not going to stand up and fight for the rights of women in this bayan because they already fed me supper already so i'm out of this town what i was going to speak about is the issue of inheritance but as he was reading i was thinking about how the sura spoke about it's speaking about inheritance what we're going to discuss but in inheritance normally who gets knocked it's going to be the girl again it's going to be the sister the daughter the one who doesn't know much and she's too shy to go to the mufti and say is this masala right but we have entered a time we forget the sister and the daughter being knocked also sometimes even the other brothers are being knocked so this is a issue inheritance which is not easy to discuss it's delicate very delicate The man can be Mufti Sahib's best friend, best friend. 
But now when he brings that fatwa and he wants the signature of Mufti, Mufti can't sign. Because he knows what you now speaking about is not right. <coughs> so I will explain to you a few points. May Allah Taala make it beneficial for all. The ruku that he read, if you ever did hifz of Quran, you will understand this is not an easy ruku. You seekumullah. So on the phone today when I told whoever I told Karissa read you seekumullah, first thing was Allah. Like, this is, so I told you, no, read inside. <laughs> this is not Ramzan time. This. Alhamdulillah, he read outside, so he did a good job. This is not an easy ruku at all. It's confusing. This ruku is so confusing because this is one of the few places in Quran where Almighty Allah discusses maths. The maths of the entire inheritance is discussed in the few pages in such a manner that even the master of inheritance, when he comes to these ayat, he also goes in circles. But how the ruku starts? Speaking about inheritance, but before this ruku, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ الْيَتَامَ zulma. Verily the one who eats the wealth of the orphan, the one who eats the wealth of the orphan, zulman taking his rights. So it means the big brother was passing away. The younger brother, he told the small children, you're too small, stay in madrasa. I'll handle the estates. That is called now zulam. They got no one to cry to. He's the boss and he got the signature. And now he starts enjoying. He sends, he pays for their fees. Whenever they ask him, where's our money? He said, you think I'm going to steal your money, but he's not giving. إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ نَارًا Almighty Allah says, he must know what is he putting in the stomach. He is putting fire. He is putting fire in this world. وَسَيَصْلَوْنَ سَعِيرًا and a day will come where he will have to enter in the fire. Entering in the fire, we're going to discuss in detail just now, Jahannam. I want to explain to you at this point. Already he is putting fire in the stomach. Already he is putting fire. Many a person thinks about when they speak of punishment, punishment coming later after I die. When you mess around with the commands of Almighty Allah, punishment comes while you are alive. A person while alive, you find him, is not living, he's not dead. A few places where we had to discuss this issue of inheritance. There were some friends of ours who went to discuss the issue of inheritance. He saw a fight take place. He saw a fight. He never knew adult people can fight in front of a moana. And because he's a small person and they big people, he decided to be referee. I told him they would have killed you also. And why do you go there? Let them fight like cats and dogs. They must come to you. You mustn't go to them. This is such a delicate issue, this inheritance. When it starts, the person who you always thought you are the most pious person in the masjid, he also breaks down money. So the surah starts like this. But remember what you're putting in your stomach. Yeah. Remember what's coming. Me and you, we worry when we eat, when we see the stomach coming out. Then you say, is this healthy? Does this have carbohydrates? Does this have sugar? Does this have this here? Allah Taala says, forget all of that. The most that's going to happen is the stomach. One person nicely the other day said to me, three brothers were arguing, or what you call competing, we were discussing of competition. He said, the one said that I bought my son that thing, that he can go from zero to hundred in five seconds. So they were like shocked, like what's that? He said, that Ferrari. Mm. The other one said, I've got that one that goes 0 to 100 in 3 seconds. He said, what's that? He said, it's the Porsche. He said, I got that 0 to 100 in 1 second. They asked, what's that? He said, bathroom scale. <laughs> so everyone's worried of that one. It was a nice one. Only he tried to say it for the wife and I changed the story. I said, why would you worry of the wife going fat? We're getting more fat. When we worried about carbohydrates, it's only going to spoil this. Have you ever thought about what it means putting fire into your body? Let's take another example. Someone passes away. He leaves behind a little wealth. But now you've got a chance to take. So you go to the person and you say, See, I can give you 100 goats. Or I can give you 500 swine pigs. Why at that moment the person says, I'll take the goats. Why is calculation don't work out? 500 is better than 100. Because he understands swine, even if it's 500, I'll sell it in the market, I'll get a half a million. 
But then I have to put that half a million in the mouth of my children. Am I ready to feed them haram for the rest of their life? He said, I won't do it. You ask him why. He said, what will the people say? So then you tell the person, okay, don't worry, no one will know about it. I'll sell the pig for you. I'll sell that 500 pigs. And the half a million I'll now put here. Five, half a million and a hundred goats. At that moment, the person of Iman will still go for the hundred goats. Why? Because no father wants to ever feed his child haram. And you know, it's not a once-off thing. I'm not taking and going for Umrah. This money is going to form the core of my business. Later on, if someone says, make your business halal, you can't just take out 100,000, give Darulum and say, now everything is halal. It doesn't work. You have to close the entire empire. Because the everything is the baby of a pig. You won't do it. In the books of Fiqh, they explain if a man is walking past and he got no food, he's dying, and he sees swine, haram, the mufti will tell him, go and eat it. It has become halal for you. They even write to such an extent, if he says, I'll never eat pig, and he dies, he will be questioned by Almighty Allah. I made that halal for you, why didn't you eat it? But the second example, that same person is walking, and somebody else's wealth is there. And he's dying. Then the mufti will tell him, you'd rather die as a martyr, but do not touch the wealth of somebody else. Now you will understand what is inheritance when you mess around. You'd rather go for the pig, but don't touch one ran of somebody else's. It's such a delicate issue this, that when Allah Tawarukullah starts discussing, you see, kumullah, wasiyat means, and that's when inheritance comes, beautiful Quran is, only if you know the meaning. Wasiyat is when the father is passing away. That's wasiyat. They say, it seems you're going now. Daddy, give us your final parting advice. Almighty Allah says, your father's advice, listen to my wasiyat to you. You say kumullah, that's why it's known as you say kumullah. If you ask for his parting advice, normally the father will say, look, up, look after your mother. Look after your daughters. Almighty Allah says, listen to my wasiyat to you. You say kumullah. And then Allah Tawarukullah starts that if there is a girl and a boy, if there's only girls, if there's only boys, if there's no children, then there's the sisters, then there's the brothers, everything. And there is sometimes the ones you don't like to hear. A man got no children, his brother is going to inherit. That is one that some people just, why must my brother inherit? So Allah Tawarukullah then says, Aba ukum wa abana ukum. We know it's your fathers. We know it's your sons. And that's why the man says, my money, my family, I know who's supposed to get. My one daughter looked after me so well. The other one, she got married, she never made a phone call. This one must get, that one mustn't get. Almighty Allah says, your sons, your parents, لا تدرون أيهم أقرب لكم نفعا But you will never be able to understand going forward who is closer to you. You only saw the small picture. Sometimes the man will still say, that's for everyone else. My example, I know it very well. 30 years, he never do one thing for me. Almighty Allah says, then leave it like that. Faridatam min Allah. Even if you feel someone supposed to get more than the other, Almighty Allah says, this is my law. Faridatam min Allah. If you understand the power of these verses. Then again Allah Tawarukullah starts discussing the husband passes away, what must the children get? The wife passes away, what must the children get? No one must cheat in this business. No one must cheat. After discussing all of that, again Almighty Allah says, Wasiyatam min Allah. This is my wasiyat to you. Whereas the father when he's giving a wasiyat, you can always say, Jiji daddy, Jiji daddy, daddy passed away, he's gone. What daddy knows? Almighty Allah's wasiyat comes when Allah is ever living. Allah says, I have given you my wasiyat, but you're going to die, not me. Are you going to live up to my wasiyat? Wallahu alimun halim. Remember, Allah is all-knowing. Did you fulfill my wasiyat? Halim, Allah is very tolerant. So sometimes when you see someone knock the other person down, and you saw nothing happened. He's living it up. Allah says, Allah is tolerant. Don't expect to see things fast. But go down the line in our small few years of experience where we saw collapsing. 
When we saw empires collapsing, an empire collapsing to me wasn't the sad part. When I saw children collapsing, children collapsing meaning they still had the money, their akhlaq collapsed. Their akhlaq collapsed. They fell into the worst of actions. That's when we were called in, help this boy out. But we would love to tell the father when you fed him pig so many years, now you want him to become a lion. But he would say, I never fed him. We knew what you fed him. It wasn't the thing. Halim, tilka hududullah. These are the commands of Allah. Hudud normally means the king puts a mark. He says, you stay in this side, don't you dare come over. This is hudud. You can enjoy grazing how much you want to hear. The grass is lovely. I know the grass on the other side is better, but it's my grass now. Ask that one cow. You have the certain sh- hunters, farmers. They enjoy if that man next door's cow comes over. They just wait for it. They just sit and poof. Got it. They wait. The grass is greener on my side, but it pains on my side. This is the meaning of tilka hududullah. You will always find the little extra which is not allowed to look so nice. Umar radiallahu anhu was given a hadiyah. He said, I do not want it. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that which comes to you. And you are not like looking, waiting like, where is it, where is it? He says, grab that. That has come with barakah, that has come with blessings. He says, as for that wealth that comes to you. And from beforehand you are waiting. When we did this narration, our Ustad explains, one of the best examples of this is the wealth of inheritance. Just when the one person gets sick, everyone starts working out. I wonder how much is leaving. Yeah, everyone's eyes. Like. That is why when you see this wealth coming, it comes with its fights, it comes with its disasters. A family who was so close, everyone was so close. You visited the house when the person passed away, everyone was sitting Everyone was smiling, you told everyone, remain united, how you remain united when your father was alive. Everyone says, G, G, G. And after that year, they all broke. What broke them? And their head went like this here, that little extra. Tilka hududullah, Almighty Allah says, you'll have to stay in the limits. And we will end on these two, meaning the tarjuma, and then we'll give an explanation. I want you to try, if you understand a little bit of the Arabic language, to understand these four lines. These four lines is what is known as the usul, the principle of inheritance. Because it's a very delicate matter. And the man who's in front, he says, I'm a very powerful man. That's why they made me the executor. Don't you dare tell me what to do. These four lines was to say, inheritance doesn't end in this world. It's a thing going to the year after. It is with this wealth that you can either purchase paradise. It is with this wealth that you can buy Jahannam. Paradise is very easy to get. Today I gave an example to the women who were listening. They say Harun al-Rashid, the great Khalif. When he went out in his time, there was a man called Bahlul, very pious man. But because he used to speak of the things of the Akhirah. And Harun rashid was a Khalifa, so you got to do with things of the world. So they respected Bahlul, but they kept Bahlul on his place like, that we want Juma Bayan, then we'll come meet you, but business time, you don't come and see us, you stay far. So Bahlul had his madrasa, he used to play with the children, he used to keep them company, look after them. So on one occasion, Arun Rashid passes and Bahlul is making his castle, sand castles, because he's keeping his children happy like, in the madrasa, they're building a castle, sand castle. So Arun Rashid looked at it, he smiled, he said, Bahlul, now what you up to? So all children, when you make children happy, so to make them happy, he said, can't you see these children are building the castles of Jannah? So Harun Rashid smiled, he said, that's very smart castles of Jannah, I mean, who will stay in that? So he asked the question, how much it costs? But if you want to buy castles of Jannah, so according to what you see, so he said, simple, this one, small one, small boy made it, one dinar, one dirham, dirham like ten rand, one dirham, five dirham, ten dirham, twenty dirham, this one is a big one. Harun Rashid laughed. Because normally if you just took out that 20 dirhams, that child would have got so happy, I'll go buy sweets like. That's what Bahlul said, pay the guy, he worked so hard. But Harun Rashid just laughed and he carried on. A while later came his wife Zubaydah. Zubaydah was famous, her generosity was unique. And the main thing of Zubaydah was when she was generous, she was generous with her money. Many of the wives nowadays are generous with the husband's money. 
How that one works? I was in one country, one person told me, the most amount of money we make tarawi ten. So I was amazed, I said like, he said, after four akats, the collection drive you have. He says, no, tarawi time, the women at home are watching Islamic channel. And in Islamic channel, they're showing there that in Syria they went and this happened and that happened. And then they just put the amount to donate. He said, while the poor uncle is making ruku, he's feeling beep, beep, beep on his phone. He's making dua, how much is going out? He's just swiping one way. He said, the most we get is when the husband is not at home. Most we get, but Zubaydah spent her own money. Very hard for women, that's for some reason. When it comes to spending their own money, you look at how they look at that thing ten times. Ten times, like. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi went to the woman, especially, he told them, it's your gold. He said, this gold will burn you in the fire of Jahannam. One sentence. They started giving their gold. Throwing their gold. He took out that love. He took out that love. We must not allow our daughters, our wives to be so gripped in the love of gold. So if they bought something which is gold, it's hard to say this one. When the time of zakat comes, the husband mustn't be so generous to pay the zakat. You must let her pay her zakat. And if she says, but I got no cash, it's only my gold. Then she must say, now sell part of that day to give your zakat. The husband must not make his wife stingy. Because what happens the one day that comes and the husband is not there? And she'll sit with that gold but she'll not be able to let it go. That woman might even go and say, I'm zakatable, I need zakat. And you ask her, you got gold, I got Lord gold. Say, sell the gold. No, my grandfather gave it to me. Said that gold will burn you in the fire of Jahannam. No one must get gripped. We must not get gripped. They know. Zubaydah was a woman who spent her wealth. So she goes past Bahlul is selling castles of Jannah. Zubaydah asks him, how much? Like? She laughs. But to make the small child happy, Zubaydah is too happy. She takes out the money says, yeah, for everyone. I buy all the castles. Bahlul smiles. The children grabs the money. They run. Everyone got something. So buy sweets and she carries on. Harun Rashid has a dream at night. He enters into a garden, beautiful palace. He walks inside. He's amazed. Far better than his palace. Who's the owner of this palace? The Khadimat say to him, the name of the owner is written outside, you can go, he goes there, he says Zubaydah. Man never ever wants his wife to be better than him, that's like one thing normal. Go play a game with your wife and see she beats you, you'll understand what I'm speaking about. And she'll make you remember it for life, like, you'll stop playing that game after that. He goes out looking at Zubaydah, how did she get a better parcel than me? And he says another garden. He goes there, he says, can't be. He says, it's even better. Because this was the one dirham. That was the five dirham. Even better. He walks inside. He asks, who is this one? He says, the name is out. When he sees Zubaydah, then he sees another garden. Every see another garden, he would have a heart attack. He just woke up. He woke up now, now he wakes up his wife. He says, what did you do now? Because Zubaydah was famous. In that time, she had taken water from Taif to Makkah, Mukarrama. The hujjaj who would drink water would drink from the well of Zubaydah or the stream of Zubaydah. It was a kamal she had done in a time from Taif. The engineers that she brought in, up till today you will see the traces of that, of that canal that she put in from one side. Engineers, top engineers came and said to her, it will never work. She said, I will make this thing work no matter what. She could not stand that the people coming for hajj and haven't got water along the way. She pulled that canal. At the time there was no machinery, the canal of Zubaydah. So he asked her, now what did you do? Because she was known, but now she had not done anything. So he asked, what are you doing now? So she's thinking like, he says, one castle, another castle, how many castles you got? So she says, now like nothing. She says, today I passed by Bahlul, he was laughing and joking, he said, I'm selling the castles of Jannah. So I gave some money like, and Harun Rashid then is like stunned. Like, I could have bought that. So whole night they ride there tossing and turning, well I meet Bahlul tomorrow, because I can make the deal, I'll give him double, like 200 dirhams. And when he comes in the morning, he's going with his people and he sees Bahlul, you get so happy normally when you'll see it like, and then you see him at the castle, so the money is already in the hand like, and even before he tells you what's the price, Bahlul, like how much is the castle? Which means like one dirham, I'll give 10 dirhams, I'll give 50 dirhams, I'll take it all. 
So Bahlu looks at that small castle. Yesterday it was one dirham. He says, I'll give you this castle and you just give me whatever you own. Your sultanate for this one. And then Harun Rashid is like holding on to his ten dirhams like, and his hand is shivering now. So he says, yesterday what was one dirham, how did it become so expensive today? So what a nice answer he gave. He says, it was one dirham for the one who never saw Jannah. It was one dirham for the one who never saw Jannah. He said, as for the one who already saw Jannah, he has to give his whole sultanate. He has to give his empire. He said, but you kings, the problem, you love your chair so much that you will not be able to give your chair and I am not going to give you the castle of Jannah. Under that, the alim wrote a nice point. He said, it is Allah's kindness that he did not allow me and you to see Jannah. Because otherwise, me and you would not have paid the price. He kept it in a veil. When someone passes away, inheritance money is not my money. I can use that which is not my money to purchase the highest place of Jannah. Because it's not my money. It's still going to come to me. So example, I'm living today how I'm living. Every month I come out nicely. I'm just coming out at the end of the month. My father passes away. That money which wasn't there yesterday... If I have to allow 10% of that money to be given to buy my paradise, you can never say it's too expensive. You will say it was money that never came. 90% is still coming. 10%. Why are we speaking of this 10%? When you want to sort out inheritance, you have to be ready to take a loss. But no one wants to take the loss. A father passes away and he leaves behind him a farm, many farms. Plots, two sons. There shouldn't be any issue really. The two sons divide everything. Some people like this farm, yours, this farm, this farm, this farm, everything divided. He leaves behind three strands of the hair of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Three strands. So in land there was no problem. Three strands. So what brother, you take one strand, I take one strand. Now they're fighting for one strand. Even in one strand, and that's a valuable strand. But So he says, the elder brother says to the younger, that I will cut the strand. You will take half, I will take half. The younger brother says, that I will never allow you to cut the hair of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The bigger brother says, then there's no way we're going to sort this out. The younger brother says, that let me have that hair. He says, no, you let me have the hair. He says, I want the hair. He said, you must pay for it. He said, what you want? Elder brother is elder brother. He said, you really want the hair? Said, no problem, take the second hair, but whatever share you're getting of daddy, give that to me. Put him in a spot. It's hard to say at that time, no, I won't do it. So the younger brother said, if you want to be so hard, you keep everything. I will take two strands of hair. Left it. They wrote this in the books. Amazing. This. He took two strands of hair. He went and he put it with a lot of azmat, respect. He put it in one place. He used to always come every day because he lost everything. Every day he would come. He would read Durud Sharif three times before coming to the hair. Then he would open the hair. He would breathe that hair like this is what I got from my father. Two strands of the hair of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then he covered it. Slowly, slowly Allah Tawarqala made it that the one who had everything started losing. And the one who had nothing, everything started getting barakah. Why won't you have barakah when you showed honor to the hair of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Khalid bin Walid radiallahu was there when Nabi Sansam's hair was being cut. He put his hand there. He only accepted Islam about two years before this. Eight year of Hijri he accepts Islam. He accepts Islam and he even writes that, he said, I could have become Muslim long time. He said, I already knew this was the truth when I fought him the battle. He said, I remember that occasion where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was in front. I was the one to launch the attack. I looked at them making their ruku and sajda. When they went into the sajda, zohar salah. As they went into the sajda, I said to myself, what an opportunity. At that moment, if I just told my shoulders, soldiers, attack, by the time they were getting up, you would have been on their heads already. Khalid bin Walid. He says, then a thought came to me, that after zohar comes another salah, asr. 
He says, this is such a salah, they'll never miss it. It means everything to them. He said, I will not launch the attack until Asr. And when they will go into Ruku, then I'll tell my soldiers, be ready. And as soon as I see them dropping to Sajda, we'll fly. He says, but when the Asr Salah came, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought one Jamaat front. This was known as Salatul Khawf, the Salah at the time of fear. But the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, half the Jamaat follows the Imam and the other Jamaat looks at the enemy. So when they go in Ruku, they don't go in Ruku half, they look at the enemy. When Khalid bin Walid saw this, this was a Salah he had never seen in his life. On that moment he said, Wallah, this is a man protected. He said, from that time I knew we're fighting the air. Like, it's not going to happen. But he still stubbornness pulled, pulled until just before the conquest of Makkah Mukarramah. He said, we're kicking the dust. He makes a journey, he comes to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah's Nabi Sallallahu gives him so much of shan that they would say later on no important decision was made except Nabi Sallallahu would say, where's Khalid? Give him so much of honor. So his hair is being cut. Only in two years he gets, he fought with Nabi Sallallahu so many years. He gets two years in his company, he loves him so much that as his hair is being cut, he's there to say, give me some of your hair. So much they love us. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what will you do with my hair? He said, oh Allah's Nabi, I'll fight with this hair. I will fight with this hair. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, then you will, never see vic- you will never see defeat as long as my hair is with you. Khalid bin Walid made a special topi for this hair. He put the hair in that topi. And then he would wear this topi and then an imama on top of it. Every time when he fought with this hair, he went through the Romans, he went through the Persians. He was unbreakable. He said, I went into every battle searching for death, but death was not going to find him on the battle. There was one or two occasions that he went out so suddenly that the hat, he forgot it. That was the only times where he really thought, I think this is the end, because he even put his hand there. And he said, I don't have my hat. And Allah Taala made it, somebody realized it in the tent. One time his wife, she heard that they in a problem. She said, can never be. She looked around, she saw the topi was there. She said, no wonder. This has to get back to him. On one occasion, the enemy knocked him. He fell to the ground. While seeing the enemy coming, he's more worried about his topi, his hat. Later on, he got out, out of that way. One man told him, the enemy is coming for you, worrying of your topi. He said, as long as this thing has been on my head, I have never found the difficulty. He enjoyed the barakah of one strand of the hair of Rasulullah sallallahu So this brother way he was not. He would respect it, make durood, his business started growing. A time came where the rich brother lost everything. He has a dream. In the dream he complains to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that after my father left where I started off from, what did I do wrong in business? And harder than that day, it doesn't make, I get irritated to see my brother is so wealthy. So first Nabi Muhammad tells him something which is very hard. That I want you to go ask your brother for a job. You must go ask your brother for a job. How hard that is. That you must go work for him. And then he says to him because what do you expect the condition of two people? One who showed respect to my hair and the other who was not bothered of my hair. He said what do you expect? That's what's going to happen. So me and you if inheritance comes. Then if that issue comes and we got two hair, then we all think, hey, I'll make that decision, you know. I'll take the two hair. Just as how honorable the two hairs are of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa When the time of inheritance comes, there's always one person who says that sharia is preventing us making a good deal. Can't you allow me to cut sharia? Just cut it. Then you'll get your share, I'll get my share, no one will take a loss. There has to be one brother who says, I cannot allow Sharia to be cut. I can't. Sometimes even if one says, you want to keep it all, keep it all. But my Sharia, I'm not going to take haram. There must be someone. Mubarak to that person who the father puts in charge of the estate and he can be the one who says, how he honored the hay of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'll honor the Sharia. You have to be ready to take a loss. But if you take this loss, you're buying Jannah. 
وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَ The four ayat, four lines. Whoever will obey Allah and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning in the issues of inheritance. يُدْخِلْهُ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Allah will enter them into many gardens. You're only going to lose one garden, part of a garden, a share of a garden. He will enter him into gardens under which rivers will be flowing. He will remain in it forever and ever and ever. وَذَٰلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ You said, I missed a million, I missed half a million. Almighty Allah says, compared to that, what you're asking about? And some people, nature is such, you tell them, I'll give you Jannah, they think, ah, Jannah will come on its time. So for that person, Allah Tabarukullah says, if you're not so thrilled with Jannah, then remember Jahannam is also there. Do you really want to purchase Jahannam? Whereas how much money can you get in this world? The food that can go in the stomach is only a certain amount. Then it's food for everybody else. Clothing is for everybody else. But the fire is going to be for me and you. Who will disobey Allah and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and who will jump over that barrier. That's that wealth which was just on the other side. I wanted that. It wasn't his. يُدْخِلْهُ نَارًا خَالِدًا فِيهَا Allah will enter him into a fire. خَالِدًا in which he will stay forever and ever and ever. This is the spot. Very dangerous. It is the principle of the ulama that if a person dies with iman, he will never stay in Jahannam forever and ever. But it is very hard to explain this verse. That the principle is made in the light of Quran. And Quran is saying, I will keep him in the fire forever and ever and ever. Ulama have explained this issue in different ways. And everyone is as scary as the other. Some of them have mentioned if a person messes around with inheritance, there is a fear that he will die in kufr. And he will remain in the fire forever and ever and ever. Because that money that he will continue eating will just rot the entire body. It will make his nature more and more and more dirty and filthy. A time will come where even what he never thought, he will start becoming upset with Almighty Allah. Because he's only eating. When you eat dirt, 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 your inside starts rotting. Later on when you're going to die, that rot comes out like gangrene. You never knew what was happening in the leg. You were just feeling the pain. But the day they cut... You just see green coming out, green coming out. They say inside was rotten. Some have mentioned this. Others have mentioned that even if he dies with Iman, he will be kept in a fire for so long, so long, so long, that when he has to be asked, how long are you here? He will say forever and ever and ever. He will see everybody else coming out of the fire. Some have mentioned that this is the punishment that Allah has written. That you are actually deserving to be in the fire forever. Like, like where the judge says, just throw away the key also. I don't want you coming out. He says, a day will come where even that man, Allah's mercy will cover him. But just that, I don't want you coming out. Whichever of the three meanings you take, it is very, very hard meanings. Ulama have mentioned they have not seen a punishment where the word is written there forever and ever and ever in Quran except on two. A Muslim who kills another Muslim intentionally and one who takes the inheritance of somebody else. It's not worth it. So that is the principle. Then there is furu'at where people will call us and tell us, help us in this issue. So there's a few points I will mention. One is if ever you're going to be passing away soon and everyone one day has to pass away, you will always think about who must you make your executor. This is that point which is so easy for the man who got no money. The man who got no money, he's not bothered. He said, when I pass away, they won't fight for my money. I got no money. Why they must fight? And they were those people. Before passing away, they gave their wife whatever they owned. But you must understand, your wife must be your wife. Eh? You do wrong to your wife, she'll kick you out of the house. So if you got the right wife, they were those who gave their wife everything. And then they said, now I'll borrow clothing from you. But i rather tell you, don't try it in South Africa. You don't get those women around here. So let's leave that one out. Let's say another one. 
You have to make someone your executor. Who are you going to make? Normally the man will say, someone I trust. Who I trust? My son. Very good. Because he knows the business. The problem is the son is also an inheritor. So do you trust him so much or does he trust himself so much when the issue comes? Then I will make sure everyone will get an exact amount. Because when money comes, even that which is pure becomes rotten. So do you put so much of trust in your son which is actually saying like you got a worker in the shop, we go to some shops, we tell the boss, he says, you know, this worker, you can trust him. Just that sentence, you can trust him. And we tell the person, you putting that worker in Jahannam. By you putting so much money in front of him, and you telling him, I give you my trust, he is going to take one day. By you putting every signature in the hand of one son, and later on he cheats, Sometimes you will say the problem is the father. That how could he put so much of temptation in front of one? And how could that son say, Daddy, I trust myself, give it to me and I'll sort it out. Rather the son must say that Jahannam is very scary, I don't want this. So now everyone must say, I don't want to be executor. That's the best. I don't want to be the executor because let somebody else hand it, whatever comes to me, I'll take it. Let me handle it to make it work. I must put my own money in to make it work. So don't rush to be the executor. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed people to go and collect wealth. He appointed them and when he would send them, he would say certain words. That when the person would come back as a money collector, what we call a tax collector. When he would come back, he would say, I brought all of this wealth, O Nabi of Allah, or O Abu Bakr, or O Umar. And now that I brought it, here's it, I can ask you one thing, after today don't ever appoint me again. He says, because that amount of worry and concern I had, Allah's Nabi would say to his Sahaba, I'm sending you to collect the zakat, let me not meet you on the day of Qiyamah, and I see you walking in front of me and there's one animal on your head, and that animal is making its loud sound, uh, uh. everyone is looking and that animal will say, this man was sent to collect zakat. When he went there, the farmer told him, like what we call the tax man comes. Tax man comes to the house, we tell him, before you see the books, you don't want samosas and tea. So he says, yeah, that's what I want really. As he's there, 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 in the ending, he just signs out. But in the Islamic world, there was never something like this. In the Islamic world, the man would go, he would be told, don't take the best animal, don't take the lowest. You will take in between. When he would come to the farm to collect the zakat, if that man told him, you know, one animal for you. The sahabi radiallahu anh, came, he said, oh Allah's Nabi, this is the zakat I collected. And this animal was given as a hadiyah to me. Nabi Islam became so upset. He said, why don't you go sit at home, sit at home and wait for the hadiyah to come. If the hadiyah comes then from that man, I'll say that man likes you, that's why he sent the hadiyah. He said, this was not hadiyah, this is because you went to him, it's called rishwa. He was so hard, sahaba radiallahu anhu would say, don't ever appoint me again. So much of stress, so much of stress. If a person understands what it is to be that executor, to make that signature, he will say, you rather appoint someone outside, who's not going to get one cent from this thing. He will do it as a business. He will say, your share, your share, your share, I'm getting nothing. Best person to appoint, however, is a Morana. But now these Moranas are sharp also. Just thought they'll take all for their madrasa. <laughs> My one friend, he gave a nice one the other day. He said, he said, you heard this narration. It's not a narration at all. He said, you heard this narration. What's the strongest thing in the world? So he said, because it comes in one narration, like the power of water, water. And the power of iron, and the power of wind. You saw the wind, how it takes the water. And you saw the water, how it can move certain things. Everything got power. Water got power, wind got power. Iron got power, but iron, what melts iron? Fire. Fire got power. And then he said, what's more powerful than fire? So everyone is quiet. It's sadaqah. Because when sadaqah is given, even the fire is extinguished. Sadaqah. Then he said, what's more powerful than sadaqah? So we all stand. He said the molisa because he eats the people's sadaqa. <laughs> he eats the sadaqa. <laughs> so it's a different world now. Everyone wants. That is why this ayat of Quran 
is for everyone. You cannot police anyone. It is Almighty Allah said, I'm warning you, don't play games. So you will have to first choose who do I feel will be the best. You might not always make the right decision, but choose at least. Your job is only to make an effort. Don't put it in someone's hands who's going to collapse. You look for someone who you can trust. Thereafter, if you were wrong in that decision, Almighty Allah will never take you to task. But don't just hand it over. You'll have to think about, this is a big empire, I don't want them to fight afterwards. So that's number one, who's the executor? Even if it means bringing in a company, a firm, and they're going to charge you a certain percentage, but you know then everything will be sorted out, everyone will get their share. So I'd rather just do that. Don't just leave it how it is, they're going to fight. First one, executor. Number two, when the time comes for the family to get together, the executor or whatever, the big brother, he has to come now and he has to put everyone's share in place. So this is where many people say, someone passed away. So the question is, how long must you take in the distribution of the estates? There were ulama of the past, they were sitting by someone who was passing away. As soon as he passed away, that alim, there was a candle there, he blew out the candle. So one of the people said that, the man passed away, you made it dark. He told the person, go to my house and bring one candle. He said, because you see this wax of this candle belonged to this man. Now that he passed away in this family, there are some children who are not mature. Do we have their permission to use because they got a share in this wax also? He said, they got a share. Where we will say, you're overdoing it. There were those people, they were very worried of that small amount also. So if you, someone passes away and there is no one immature, we say Mubarak to the death. Sort out the inheritance so quickly. Don't let that day come that the inheritance is still hanging, that old inheritance. And then someone passes away and now there is immature people. Because when there is immature, you can't make decisions on their behalf now. Now everything becomes holding, it's a very hard decision. So if someone passes away and everyone is mature, when they all mature and they get together and someone passed away, there's two. One is a mature person does a mature act. What is a mature act? They sit day and day and they say inheritance is very important. The marhum will never get peace until we sort out this matter. So let's sort it out. That's called maturity. Immature. On that night they sit and the one person says to the others, Daddy passed away, mommy is in the house, you want your share, you want your share, you want your share. Everyone is crying. So they say, no, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want, say very good, very good, very good, mommy will keep everything, game over. Morana, next day we sorted out last night, one shot, say, mashallah, mubarak. That is called immature sorting out. When a person is forced in an emotional situation, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, let a judge not make a judgment while he's angry. Let a judge not make a judgment while he's angry. If that judgment of the judge, a judge is a man, but he's angry, he's got no weight. A poor girl, you ask her, your father passed away, you want your money, you want your money. What's she going to say? She's going to say, yeah, I want it. She has to be given time. She has to be told how much. She must be told, go make mashara with your husband. There must be no immediate. Sort it out that night means, if you want to on that night say, this is what the whole thing is. Now everyone go and make istikhara now. Everyone come back and we'll see what is the best way we're going to meet in two weeks time. That's called sorting out. Already on that night everyone is calm now, isn't it? Now the marhum is also calm. My big son, he sorted out the whole matter. I know it's going to work two weeks time, three weeks time, everyone sits down. Now it starts. Executor. Mature people. If there was no mature people, like that's what happens everywhere. Now they're fighting, now it's two years, three years, four years, that's when they come to us and they say, come help us in the situation. So in this one year we normally say, if a husband and a wife are fighting, Quran has made a decision, hakamam min ahlihi wa hakamam min ahliha, that he must say that I appoint so and so to represent me. And she must say, I appoint so and so to represent I trust this one, I trust. But what a hakam is? A hakam is like a judge. That I have made this person the judge. What decision he makes is binding on me. So if the brothers and sisters are all fighting, then if a husband and wife 
I told you all don't make decisions anymore. If you all could do anything, you all won't be fighting. Hand it over to somebody else in the issue of inheritance. If two, three, four years have gone and you still can't sort out anything, hand it over to somebody else. If you don't trust one person's rai, put two or three people together. Get three scholars, three people of intelligence. Tell them all of us are unanimous. Your decision is binding on all. Here's all the documents, all the papers. Why? Because just like how I will not like to be eating pig and feeding my children pig, I'm sure also you will not like that. The small cell that goes in, it's either your Jannah or it's your Jahannam. You will spoil the character of your entire progeny. Hakamam min ahlihi. I'll give it over. Hand it to somebody else. You make the decision. When that decision will come, definitely it will come more than that one brother said, take everything away, give me the hair of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You will be saying, that even if I have to take a loss, give me the sharia of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But I'm not going to cut it. Mubarak to that man who can say, I honored the sharia. Allah will allow his business to start growing. He will only see barakat and goodness. It will just get bigger, bigger, bigger. Don't interfere with the wealth of Allah. That person will say, but that money I lost. Because when the hakam comes inside, then he says, you know what, like she must get, she must get, she must get. So remember when someone passes away, the money doesn't come to the inheritors immediately. That person who passes away, the true waris, the true inheritor is Almighty Allah. The money goes back to Allah. And then Almighty Allah makes a decision, I want you of this money so much, you so much, I don't want anything. But it's my money. When a person gets angry and says, I'm losing, he's as though saying to Almighty Allah, you're stealing my money. That's what he's saying. Because Almighty Allah took it. And now Almighty Allah says, that one must get, that one must get. When that individual says, why must he get? Who is telling them? The father is dead. father is dead. So these were a few principles of inheritance that I wanted to discuss. Because I have seen very, very good people, but they lose their entire akhirah at a time where it's not worth it. That money for the living, I never saw it giving any benefit at all. And the man passing away where he says, I'll make sure my brother doesn't inherit. That sentence never made sense to me. I told him, like, you can just change your sentence to say, I'll make sure I'll burn in the fire forever and ever. But because people have never understood this issue. I gave this lecture in one masjid. It made me so happy when one brother came to me. He said, I never knew inheritance was discussed in Quran. He said, I never knew it was discussed in Quran. The way he looked at me is like, you know, I've been cheating my sisters for so long. Like, May Allah make it happen that he went and he sorted out the matter. But he made me so happy when he said, I never knew like, that Allah discussed this matter so well in Quran. May Allah tabarakallah, make it, we learn it, we teach it to our children, we teach it to everyone else. Wealth comes and wealth goes. Don't ever let your wealth be the cause of you purchasing Jahannam. You rather lose little bit here and there and get big things in the year after. And that little extra that you think you're getting, if it's not supposed to be for you, it's not going to take you anywhere. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.